Lord, we thank you for this gathered community of St. Margaret's, our family. We thank you that you call us to plant and to water, but that you and you alone give the growth. Give us courage to plant and wisdom to water so that you and you alone would be lifted up. And we ask you this in the holy and blessed name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's my pleasure to appoint as chair of this meeting Clint Curl and to appoint as secretary for this meeting Jana Neufeld. Good afternoon, Is my voice amplified? No? Is it now? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, just a few brief announcements before we begin. First of all, uh, if you haven't signed the uh, Declaration of Church Membership, it's at the back. You need to sign that. Uh, to vote and you have to attend a service here if you're over 16 you could sign so make sure you've done that we do number two have people joining by remote I think um, unfortunately uh, if you're joining by remote uh, you you can't vote but you do have a voice so if you have a question or comment you could type it into the chat and we'll try our best to introduce it into the meeting um, thirdly just as a, a point of courtesy we're going to be trying to use parliamentary rules today, which means we're using motions and seconds and so forth. So for those who move in second, I think Jana and I know you all, but still say your first and last name. It makes the secretary's job easier, right? And lastly, before we begin, it's always good form to begin a business meeting with a joke. <laughs> so, real estate agent says to the southern lady, this house is without a flaw. Southern lady replies, without a flaw? Whatever do you want walk on? <laughs> it's time now to uh, look at the agenda. I will entertain a motion and a second to accept the agenda as circulated. Uh, Larry Reynolds is a motion. Do I have a second? Your name? 
Okay, did you get that? Thank you very much. We have the agenda approved. Um, I'd like to put out a call for new business. So those are items that are not written in our agenda. I would like to receive them in writing. Please bring them to me at the break. So we'll have a break after the budget is presented. Uh, okay, before we get to section four. So we'll have a five minute recess. At that time, if you have any new business, have it in writing and bring it up to me, okay? The uh, last year's minutes, 2022 minutes, uh, were made available, correct, uh, at the back, yeah. Um, I need a motion and a second to accept the 2022 minutes. That's last year's minutes of parish meeting. Looking for a motion. Bit a bit of bye, bit a bit of bye. <laughs> Nobody will move. Larry Reynolds moves. Okay. Jerry, the committee. Okay, so those, uh, and uh, so uh, maybe we could do it by uh, a show of hands. All those in favor of approving the 2022 minutes, looking for a simple majority, please raise your hand. It is approved. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn to uh, our Rector Bonnie Dowling for opening remarks. I will keep these opening remarks quite brief, or as brief as I can. What's that from? Uh, mostly because you're going to hear a lot more from me in the presentation of the budget. But this opening thought is inspired by some bedtime reading, not my own, but my daughter Phoebe's. It's my, been my great pleasure this year to begin the reading of the Harry Potter series to my oldest daughter Phoebe. For those who may not yet know, and just on the off chance that there's somebody here who doesn't know, uh, bear with me, I think many of us do know, Harry Potter is the hero of the critically acclaimed novel series by British author J.K. Rowling. Harry is a young boy living in a, a fairly miserable existence with his miserable aunt and uncle when on his 11th birthday he discovers that he is in fact a wizard. I'm going to spare you all the accents and voices which Phoebe would like to assure you is the right call to make here. Uh, beyond his wildest dream, Harry's wildest dream, this revelation is followed by an invitation to attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. It's a gigantic castle hidden away in England someplace. I like to picture it in the Lake District of the North, and it reads a lot like a Catholic boarding school. Really, one of the greatest parts of the series is Hogwarts the Castle. It's a huge rambling place where paintings can talk, the ghosts are mostly friendly, and the vast staircases to the classrooms and the dormitories all move of their own accord. But one of the really um, incredible features of Hogwarts Castle, I've realized, is the Room of Requirement. The Room of Requirement is a magical secret room that appears only when someone is in great need of it. One could walk by it without ever knowing it was there, as most Hogwarts students do. It's also called the Room of Hidden Things, because so many would find its doors magically appeared while they were desperate to find somewhere to hide something. And so the room became filled with all kinds of things, hats, jewels, thousands of books, pieces of dragon eggshells, broken and damaged furniture. Some students happened upon it when they themselves were looking for a place to hide. But the room could transform, becoming what the student or professor in need required. Harry, for instance, discovers this room when he is searching for a place for him and his, some fellow students to train in some real defense against the dark arts as Dumbledore's army while hiding from umbrage, an awful and oppressive new headmaster. What he discovers in the room of requirement is a great big hole, free from all the detritus of generations of hidden things, big enough for an army of students to train in. In fact, Harry is told about the room by one of the house elves working in the castle, Dobby. How many people know about it? Harry asked. Dobby answered, very few, sir. Mostly, people stumble across it when they need it, sir. But often, they never find it again for they do not know that it is always there, waiting to be called into service, sir. This, it has seemed to me of late, is really quite a remarkably fitting image of the church, perhaps particularly a parish church. Because isn't this true for so many of us, that we have walked by this odd little brick building so many times without giving it a thought, or giving it a thought, but just a curious one, wondering especially what's with all the poetry in the sign box outside. Or maybe we didn't walk by this church, but some other one, some other place or time, not even noticing it, really. It is a strange part of the gift of a parish church, 
that here it stands, this little red brick building, a recognizable landmark in the middle of Wolseley, so many walking by it but only half aware of it, perhaps wondering why its doors are quite so ornate, or why its windows are so high up, or why people pouring out of it on Sundays look so often pleasant and peaceful. Until one day, they do stumble through that doorway. Until one day, we walked in off the street, or drove right up to it, and found that behind those beautifully strange-looking doors, there was so much more inside than one could ever have guessed from outside. The place opens up, and we find, hopefully, or begin to find at least, something of what we were looking for. Isn't this what we hope to be? Hope to be turned into by the very grace that has gathered us all together. A room of requirement. A place where those who are looking can find not just what they want, but what it turns out they really need. A place to cry. A place to rest. A place to stop and think. A place to be told their sins are forgiven. A friend, or ten friends. A place to train for a fight. A place to discover what a faithful, caring, and healthy community looks like. A place to fall to their knees and give thanks and worship. A place to discover that in the end, all the way down, there is grace, and then grace, and still grace. We can't and don't and won't meet every need. There are certain things even the room of requirement can't do, like make food out of thin air. But what we could, what we can, but that we could and can meet so many varied and changing needs speaks to the incredible strength and constancy of this congregation, standing on a firm foundation, working to faithfully discern the claim of the gospel of Jesus Christ on us, waiting always to be called into his service. Shortly, you will have a budget presented to you, a budget that I hope will enable us to continue to open up this room, to continue to minister in creative, flexible, and challenging ways to the needs of all those who come looking for God here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. We will receive uh, Bonnie's opening remarks for information. We now turn to the business of filling our offices for 2023. I would like to invite the nominations chair. We'll first deal with the appointments, uh, which do not require a vote, and then we'll go to the elected offices, which do. So, first appointments, uh, please, uh, nominating chair, could you present the appointments? Um, I'm Stephen Kramusa, I'm the nominations chair, and uh, appointed as rector's warden is Val Neufeld. Appointed as deputy Rec rector's warden is Will Rue. Appointed as envelope secretary is Kristen McLean. And appointed as treasurer is Stu Taylor, with the assistant treasurer appointed Ali Vidal. All right, thank you. We will receive those appointments for information. However, we do require a motion, uh, and the motion is that the deputy wardens, uh, or that the um, rector's warden and deputy wardens be ex officio members of vestry. So would anyone like to make that motion? That, okay, I see uh, at the back. Ryan Turnbull. Ryan Turnbull, and. Point of order. Point of order, yes. What is ex officio? Ah, ex officio means that they be a member of vestry uh, uh, by virtue of their office, not having been elected. Can they vote? Yes. Any other questions? We have a motion. Uh, we do not yet have a second. Amy Knight seconds. Question? Oh, uh, that was a second, yeah. Then we're good. Okay, it's a third. <laughs> There's no more discussion. We'll put it to vote by a simple show of hands, looking for a majority. All those in favor of making uh, uh, rector's warden and deputy warden ex officio members of vestry raise your hands, and we have a majority. 
Thank you. We will now turn to uh, the elected offices. Um, now, before we do that, uh, we need to set things up properly. So first, uh, we need to appoint uh, some scrutineers to count some votes. Uh, I believe we have some already identified. Uh, so I would welcome a motion that um, uh, uh, assigns Mackenzie Taylor, Lowell Friesen, Noah Curl, and Pam Friesen, Pam Friesen uh, as scrutineers for our meeting. Can I get a motion to that effect? Okay, Heather Milne uh, moves, second. Okay, thank you, did you get that? Who's the second? Heather Dixon, oh. Heather Dixon second. All in favor of appointing these people so mentioned as scrutineers, please raise your hands. Passed, motion is passed. We need a second motion uh, to move that the ballots used in elections of wardens, vestry, and synod delegates be destroyed following the meeting. This is a standard uh, motion. Uh, so I would look for someone so to move. I see a hand in the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a second to this motion? Stu Taylor. Stu Taylor. So we have a motion. Any discussion on this? Not seeing any. All in favor of destroying the ballots after elections, raise your hands. We have a majority. It is passed. Very good. I will now turn back to... Um, this will be the, yeah, the uh, nominations chair to bring forward uh, the um, nominations for People's Warden and People's Deputy Warden. And this has an alternate nomination. Yeah. Right, so point, this is a point of, of, uh, of uh, procedure. Um, the chair cannot nominate himself. So <laughs> we are gonna go to another member of the nominating committee to make this nomination. My name is Caleb Olford. The nomination for the People's Warden is Stephen Carmusa. <laughs> and the nomination for Deputy People's Warden is Kelly Milne. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, are there any further nominations from the floor for People's Warden or Deputy Warden? I'm gonna go three times. That's first call. Looking for nominations for People's Warden or Deputy Warden. Now second call. Now third call. I wish I had a gavel. <laughs> nominations are closed. All right. Um, so in that case, if there are no nominations from the floor, then we have a declaration. As chair, I will declare that uh, Stephen Kremusa is uh, 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 People's Warden, and Kelly Milne is uh, Deputy Warden. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, back to more nominations. We're now turn our minds to Vestry. Uh, nominating Chair, who do you nominate for Vestry? So nominations for Vestry are as follows. Chris Bandman. If you wave, maybe someone will look at you. All right. Chris Bandman, John Brubacher, Nathan Duick, Joanne Epp, Sabina Fazaludin, Fazaludin, Sabina Fazaludin, Amy Knight, Joanna, Johanna Hanford, Caleb Olfert, Eric Parsons, Rebecca Whittacombe, and Ryan Weeb. Well, thank you, Stephen. All those names have been read and are also listed in our agenda. Are there any further nominations for Vestry from the floor? Going once, going twice, three times. Nominations are closed. I believe we can have up to 20. So 
with that list of 11. Eric, are you standing? Did you want the floor? that you wanted, I'm sorry, that you wanted to be on the slate of nominees to vestry so that you had a mandate from the parish to be at meetings. <laughs> You're... You're correct that members of the clergy are ex officio members of a parish vestry. Now you have a fresh mandate from the parish. <laughs> <laughs> Point of order. I'd just like to ask the chair to remind everybody to please come to the back so people uh, here listening in from home can please uh, can, can hear the questions or to repeat the question that's on the floor in the mic. Thank you very much. So yeah, that's an excellent point. Those who have things to say from the floor, please use the microphone so it, it is, can be shared with those joining by Zoom. Thank you for that. So back to uh, where we're at. I believe we're in uh, line for a declaration. I declare as chair that the uh, uh, slate of nominees for vestry as presented be elected. Let's give them a round of applause. Now again, turning to the nominating chair to present the list of nominees for Synod Delegates. The following people, the following people have been nominated as Synod Delegates. Tracy Curl, Paul Dick, Nathan Duick, Sabina Fazaludin, Fazaludin, sorry, Fazaludin, and Caleb Olfert, Chris Kulitin Kubel, Jules Rempel and Nathan Rempel are the eight nominated delegates. Thank you, Stephen. Are there any further nominations for synod delegates? And I believe these would be people who have just been elected to vestry, right? No, they, no. Are, they don't have to. They be don't? Vestry. They could be anyone, okay. They're ex officio members of vestry. No, but uh, when we're inviting more nominations for synod oh. delegates. It can be anybody. It can be anybody. Anybody signed into the meeting. Okay, that's great. So we open the floor for further nominations for Synod delegates. <laughs> uh, Eric, I'm going to request that you use the microphone for the sake of people who are joining online. Other people, here we are. Like other people here, I spent two and a half years in the doldrums, right? So some of the people here I'm not familiar with, and, and I would wonder if all of the people that are nominated as synod delegates could, could stand up so I can at least see them for a minute or so. So the request is uh, to have those who are uh, nominated that we just read to synod uh, to please stand. stand. I, I'm not sure all of them are here Oops. is the challenge. Uh, point, of order. point of order. Are we going to have to reduce this list to four people? Or is everyone that is nominated going to synod? Yeah. So, in the olden days, we had a limit of the number of synod delegates. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question. The question, just to repeat it for those online, is uh, we have eight people. Uh, who have been uh, nominated for synod, what is the limit or the number of people that can actually go? So the answer is that we are entitled to four lay delegates and four alternates. So the four people, we're going to do a vote right away once we get through the nominations. And the four people with the greatest number of votes will act as our synod delegates. The next four people in ascending order 
will act as alternates uh, if the delegates uh, are unable to attend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we will now go. Are there any further nominations for Synod beyond the eight names already listed? I'll ask a second time, any nominations uh, for Synod? Asking now a third time, any nominations for Synod? Nominations are now closed. All right, we will then uh, go to ballot. Uh, I did call the scrutineers forward at this point. Now, can I just see one of the ballots just as chair to confirm its accuracy? Okay, it looks great. So we have the eight names printed on the ballot. These are our nominations. Um, and how does it work? You Four? You're allowed up to four. Up to four X's by names. Uh, we will then do a count, and then I'll announce the results of the count uh, after our break. So I invite the scrutineers now to, to distribute. I'm not voting. Uh, it is not compulsory to vote for four names, but scrutineers will tally the votes from greatest to least. So, to come up with the four delegates and four alternates. I think it's on the new here. Maybe Oh yeah, it's not great.
I see the scrutinies are almost done. Uh, is there any other ballots yet to be filled out? Okay, looks good. Thank you, scrutineers. We'll now uh, turn to expressions of thanks. I invite Bonnie to take the floor. We have quite a few people to thank this afternoon. Well, first, um, those are our outgoing members of Vestry and our outgoing Synod delegate. Our outgoing Synod delegate is Terry Gertson. Our, our outgoing members of Vestry are Dustin Beniston, Larry Reynolds, Terry Gertson, Nathan Epp, Rajiv Mall, Heather Milne, and Kenji Dick. We want to thank you for the time and energy you have given us as part of the vestry this year, not to mention the wisdom and insight that we've received from you. It has really been an excellent vestry to work with this year. We are truly grateful for your service to the parish in this way. Would you please join me in thanking them? Also, our own Kurt Armstrong has taken pieces of the old floor and turned them into these little crosses. And this is our gift to outgoing members of Vestry from now on. So if you ever want one, you're going to have to join Vestry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to think? I have the privilege of thanking Stan Duick for being the treasurer for the past year. Stan is built like a football player, and any job that comes his way, he absolutely tackles and demolishes, which is what he did to the treasurer role over this past year. With a huge amount of attention, diligence, and energy, he undertook and oversaw a number of initiatives. Um, and so we're just very, very grateful to Stan. for all. He's in Mexico right now, so good for him. But thank you to Stan for his amazing work. outgoing people's warden. What can one say about Stu Taylor? When Stu was asked to let his name stand to be people's warden last, uh, in 2019, I told him, oh, it's not a major time commitment. It's a couple of evening meetings, no big deal really. That was February of 2019. <laughs> so within a year, he was actually the people's warden when the rector of 28 years retired, and we found ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. So a bit more of a time commitment than I had really wagered on. But Stu not only weathered the storms with characteristic cool, he steered the ship with a steady hand and a keen sight for where we were headed. He has been a very wise counsel on the executive and an incredibly faithful servant in attending to the matters of this parish. Thank you very much, Stu, for everything you have done and accomplished in this past few years. We look forward to what God will bring in the next chapter of your leadership at St. Margaret's. Please join me in thanking Stu. Um, lastly, way back at last year's AGM, you might remember that Nora Hogman gave a beautiful, inspire, inspiring, and really riveting ministry report on her work in the back gardens, really her work in the community of this parish through the back gardens. Since then, Nora has decided she'd like some time just to garden her own gardens, <laughs> Uh, we think that that makes quite a bit of sense. So she will be stepping away from tending to our plots. It's been a long time coming, but we wanted to give Nora a gift and express our deep, deep gratitude for her ministry here. Watching her work has been an inspiration and a true grace to a great many of us. So please join me in thanking Nora. Thank you very much, Bonnie, for that. We are now turning to the 2023 budget. Now, for clarity, we're going to have a budget presentation right now. We will not yet be voting on the budget. The vote on the budget happens further down on the agenda after our recess. So what this will be is a presentation of the budget for information Further down on the agenda after the break, we will then entertain a motion to approve the budget, and there is where we will have our discussion. Any questions on that? Very good. 
Then we will proceed with the presentation of the 2023 budget led by Bonnie Dowling, Director, and Graham McFarlane. I'm going to use this one now, but I would love for that projector to turn on. Hmm. We all witnessed when it worked before, right? Okay. Just hit it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, what I'm going to do is actually just carry on. Hopefully our slides will catch up to us eventually. Um, but for now, I'll just direct your attention to the chart in the budget, uh, in the agenda booklet. Oh, it's coming. There it is. We did it. Excellent. You see? It's like a slow build, just for anticipation's sake. Look at that beautiful place. One might think that this is a shrinking budget, that the pandemic has meant that we've had to scale back, downsize, that everything has um, really grinded to a halt and it's only gonna stay that way. Or that the critics are right, that Anglican churches are slowly going ex extinct and it's all downhill from here. But that just is not the truth of this budget. It is true that the big number, 540, is $9,000 less than last year's budget. Last year we set our budget at $549,000 and this year the budget committee on behalf of Vestry is proposing a budget of $540,000. But last year, the Budget Committee also estimated that we would receive $15,000 in government grants. And this year, we have not included any government subsidies in our budget at all. So by comparison, uh-oh. <clears throat> if we took that figure out of last year's budget and all other things being equal, we would have set the budget at around $534,000 which means that this year's budget is actually about $6,000 ahead of last year. This budget is not the budget of a shrinking church. It is the budget of a growing body and an incredibly faithful congregation. And it's the budget of a scrappy bunch of ministry leaders who took every extra dollar that we had been given over the last two years and not only turned it into ministry, but started to dream new dreams about what all of these ministries could be, about what else we could do. And then those same leaders paid attention and got the message that what we need to do right now is to keep in lockstep with what the congregation here believes they have been called to give. So for the next year, what we are going to do is let all that energy, all the creativity and vision fuel our work while keeping many of our expenses lower, working to fundraise for particular projects and work to ensure that God's faithfulness is what's driving our faithfulness to the mission and vision of this parish. In the end, this budget reflects a continued commitment to this mission and vision statement that have been guiding this parish for so many years, as well as a renewed commitment to our theological principles. But it also reflects the new challenge that it is to work towards this mission and vision in an ever-changing context. We have new economic concerns, new cultural questions, new social and ethical responsibilities, new parishioners who will add their own gifts to the shape and color of our common life. At this point, I'd like to call on the Budget Committee Chair, Heather Milne, just to speak a little bit about the makeup of the committee this year and the process by which we came to this budget. Do you want to use this microphone? Sure. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, it's been my privilege to actually chair this committee for, I think, three years now. And um, I, along with a very prayerful, insightful, and thoughtful group of parishioners, I think had a, one of the more challenging jobs um, in terms of the budget process this year. Um, however, we did so with a lot of hope, a lot of prayer, and I think we can say a lot of integrity in the process. And so the budget that you see before you reflects that. Um, as in the last couple of years, we, um, the process That's involved uh, getting together with uh, Ali Vidal, who, as you all know, uh, is responsible with her great calculative insight to develop an estimate of giving uh, following the Consecration Sunday. Uh, that estimate of giving is then um, 
uh, tabulated and put into a template. We then ask all of the ministry, we approach all of the ministry leaders, each of the committee members talk individually with the ministry leaders and ask them to reflect on their budgets for this upcoming year, what kinds of things they would like to see happen, and um, what uh, dollar amount is attached to that vision. And then we compared the two. And as I said, this year was a bit more challenging than it has been in the past. And so we had to go back to the ministry leaders and say, okay, we need you to sharpen your pencils just a little bit this year. And they did. And I think they did so very successfully. Well, again, with a lot of prayer and insight and thoughtfulness. So uh, that's been the process. We then got together several times as a committee. We went through all of the estimate of giving amounts, all of the other income that we were anticipating for this year, all of the ministry budget requests, and with a bit of debate and a lot of guidance from the executive in terms of direction that they would like to see the budget go in, we were able to come up with the budget that you see in front of you today. So I would just like once again to thank the budget committee for all of their effort and hard work this year. I know it was, it was a little bit more challenging than probably you expected, but I think we all learned a great deal in, in having to actually um, discuss and um, sometimes debate and think through a lot of different options in order to make this budget representative of the vision and mission of St. Margaret's. So thank you. So we're going to dive into lots of the numbers here, and I'll ask you to um, think up your questions and then hold them to the end, and we'll get to all of them. So what we want to focus this presentation on is what we together hope to accomplish in the coming year. The Stewardship Committee asks all of us to consider what is God calling you to give, and the Budget Committee asks ministry leaders to ask what is God calling us to do with those gifts. So the Budget Committee, as Heather mentioned, begins by receiving from the Stewardship Committee, and in particular Ali Vidal and our Envelope Secretary Krista McLean, this big number, which they estimate by looking at the Consecration Sunday estimate of giving cards, pre-authorized giving, and the previous year's giving for, from those who did not fill out an estimate of giving card. Then the Budget Committee, with discussion, uh, oh, sorry, and um, in addition to that, they estimate any additional income based on the previous year. So open offering, so just offering that gets put in the plate on Sundays, rental income interest. Then the Budget Committee, with discussion by Vestry taken to, into account, makes a decision to go plus or minus that initial, that big amount. So for this year, that large number that Vestry was and the Budget Committee was considering was $533,000. And then the Budget Committee tries to make a decision about whether or not we think we should go plus 10 or minus 10 against that number. This year, the committee decided to go plus 7. This is a reflection of the committee's desire to remain faithfully optimistic about the potential for giving in the parish, while recognizing that new economic pressures many households face in the coming year may mean a slightly, um, a little, few more constraints on that giving. The committee has also proposed this number recognizing that the government subsidies allowed us to take a big step ahead in budgeting, and now we need to give ourselves a sort of a chance up to catch up in giving. From there, the Budget Committee works with ministry leaders to allocate the gifts that we believe we're going to receive from the congregation to turn those dollars into ministry. We're going to take some time to talk through each of these areas, Graham and I. Here's the thing, though. Some of you probably already know this, but some of these budget lines are a little bit more fun to talk about than others. And yet, most of the really exciting budget lines are only possible because of the less fun budget lines. So Graham and I have sort of paired them up, and we're going to go back and forth to talk through them. We're going to start with adult Christian formation. This is one of the fun ones. Faith-seeking understanding is a very fitting phrase to describe adult Christian formation at St. Margaret's. We are constantly trying to find new ways to make this a place to think through not only what we believe, especially through catechesis and our Ecclesial University Project classes, but also what it means for the ways that we are called to live as Christians in the world. Through lectures like the Thursday night lecture series and the Slater McGuire lecture series, through small groups, we are always looking to understand what it means that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all our lives, not just for the few hours that we spend in these lovely pews. 
And we are very excited this year to get to return to looking, uh, to doing this in ways that are most familiar to us by actually being in the same room as one another. We're looking forward to doing a lot of lectures, a lot of theology, a lot of small groups all in one another's living rooms. And another big part of our adult Christian formation is leadership development, the regular work of meeting with ministry leaders, trying to find them the resources they need in order to grow both as leaders and grow the ministries of this parish. That's a part of adult Christian formation that never really slowed down through the pandemic, and we don't anticipate ever running out of this kind of work to do. But of course, we wouldn't really be able to do any of that ministry without a governance and infrastructure that's both dynamic and stable. This is one of the less fun things to talk about. Uh, our governance and infrastructure needs to be secure in order to support existing ministries and to enable programming, make sure everyone has what they need. But it also needs to be dynamic to make sure that the institutional needs of this parish don't squelch or snuff out the energy of the Jesus movement that's at the heart of the church. The pandemic has meant no small amount of having to relearn all the systems, create systems that have just grown out of date, and begin to discern what sorts of things we maybe just don't need to do in our office anymore. And establishing those systems and growing in stability is what will enable us not only to better support existing ministries, but look for and be ready to act on new opportunities. And that's what we hope to accomplish here this year. And now over to Graham. Okay. I'm talking about pastoral care. <clears throat> so pastoral care at this parish takes as its sort of starting focus, uh, setting people free for ministry. That is the sort of vision for it. And that means discerning vocations. And that means, in turn, caring for one another and receiving gifts from one another. And for this coming year, key uh, focus for uh, what we're wanting to do is develop seniors ministry, which again, does not mean caring for seniors so much as setting seniors free for ministry, and um, a emphasis on pastoral visitation, especially for the sick, um, and continuing to support our um, very active and important prayer ministries, which are the prayer chain, uh, the prayer shawls, teams during the communion, and so forth. Um, pastoral care as a whole ministry area is led by Holy Gosen, who has just been on maternity leave, but is back, which is great. And we are very thankful to Jules Rempel, which I, I'm not, where is Jules? Anyway, f Jules, thank you very much. Jules has been and continues to be on um, a placement with her CMU program. And so she has also, she has been doing the majority of holding the pastoral care while Holly has been on maternity leave and will continue to hold some piece of that. Um, Community development. Yes, we can actually be together again. Unbelievable. Now, having said that, we are putting less money toward this ministry area than we have in the last several budgets, and that was just because we actually needed to find some, some places to make some cuts. And this was one where we thought that we could maybe get away with it hanging out without a lot of budget to hang out together, just enjoying each other's company. But what we are planning is to have some creative ways to spend time together this year, and the one that we're really looking forward to, put it in your calendar if it's not already there, is the last weekend of April, finally having a proper retirement party for David and Ruth. And we will continue to have uh, newcomer luncheons, um, which we haven't been doing for the past three years, so we're gonna start those up again. Now, um, we paired up those sort of the community life of this parish, we have paired up with the community life of the wider diocese that we belong to. And this is, I actually don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think that after, yes, after salaries, this is the single biggest ministry area that we have, which is our common ministry and mission support to the uh, diocese of which we belong. This is one of the ways in which we're able to support smaller uh, parishes and missions in the diocese, especially rural ones, and also just having an institutional life. The fact that we need a bishop, and the bishop needs to have a team. And that, um, in the same way that we, in order to be a Jesus movement and a community, we need to have our sort of internal uh, infrastructure uh, we also belong to a wider institution, and it has an infrastructure. And so uh, even though 
our overall budget has gone down this year. We have not dropped this one. We prioritized um, keeping it uh, what it was despite trying to find cuts elsewhere. Children and Youth Christian Formation. Tracy continues to lead a truly remarkable team of leaders in children and worship and in youth. Together they are welcoming children in the name of Jesus. It has been thrilling to see and hear once again so many children fill our basement every Sunday morning and make such a mass exodus in the middle of the service every uh, Sunday morning um, as well. It's felt like a long time, in fact, since we've had to think through the problems of our space constraints downstairs, but it really is a wonderful problem to have. This year's budget reflects Tracy and her team's desire to continue to grow this ministry and to deepen the Christian formation of the youngest members of our parish. And they're going to accomplish this mostly by doing what they're already doing, by coming Sunday after Sunday, Friday after Friday, to be with the youth and children, to invest in their lives, and to look with them for what it means to know God in Christ and to delight in his love. A little later, uh, we'll hear more from the youth ministry team about what drives their ministry and what they're planning for the year coming up. Staff missioners. See, the joke is that none of these are not fun to talk about, in particular, staff missioners. As has been the case for many years, the staff missioner line is the biggest in our budget by a fair bit. But as I have said before, this is an incredible steal. This represents all the staff who are on our mission or team at 15 hours or more, meaning that what lies behind this number, this is the number for this year, 28700, what lies behind that number are some of the most dedicated, talented, hardworking, imaginative, inventive, thoughtful, and courageous Christian leaders that you could ever want to find. They are even occasionally patient, and most of the time they're fairly cheerful. And what they're really here to do is to serve and empower your ministry, to try to find out what this congregation is being called to do in the world, what gifts this congregation, this body, has been graced with, and to help to discover how we can free you to use those gifts for ministry. These are servant leaders in the mission field that is here all around us. This year, the staff missioner budget reflects um, our desire to ensure that all staff members are brought up to the new provincial minimum wage, though we weren't far off it last year, and it reflects a modest cost of living increase for the remaining staff. Just in terms of the cost of living increase, the budget committee looked at making a more substantial cost of living increase um, to be uh, more comparable to the inflation rate, but realized that for the time being, what we need to do is try to make steady steps toward paying our staff more adequately and aren't actually able to make such a big jump as the current rate of inflation. So this year's cost of in living increase is a step towards trying to um, sort of catch up with where the economy is presently. Graham? Partnerships. We are looking for kindred spirits out there, the, the institutions that are doing the same kind of thing that we're doing. And our, of course, our biggest partnership is with Manitoba Pioneer Camp. That gets something like two thirds of the overall partnership budget. Uh, the strategic partnership that was um, generated probably 10 years ago now. And um, we also have a long standing relationship with Arasha, which is the other sort of main institutional partner. And we are collaborating with Arasha not only on the uh, gardens, but also on a conference that is going to be happening in June, May or June? June, June, on climate change and the theology of climate change. And finally, in partnerships, uh, Nathan Duick is organizing, um, look, getting a group of people together to look at city partnerships and what kinds of uh, partnerships we should be developing in terms of city partnerships. OK, mortgage. Okay, super fun, mortgage. But we wouldn't be able to do anything else if we did not have a building. And we would not be able to partner if we did not partner, as it were, with the past and the future, which is the mortgage. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, actually, I don't have much more to say about the mortgage. That's fair. Okay. That's very fair. I was giving um, him the hard ones, as you can tell. Worship. We remain as committed as ever to our principle of the priority of worship. Worship as adoration is our most profound act of evangelism, and it is always reaching outward. 
For many, for many, it is worship, be it a Sunday service or a Good Friday liturgy or a children's Advent pageant, that will bring many people to one day walk through those doors, curious doors of this building, and hope to discover something of a room of requirement, the place that they've been looking for. So one of the ways that we communicate this priority and remind ourselves of it and are shaped by it is by a continual pursuit of excellence in worship. This year, the budget for this area doesn't include new funds for major new projects, but it does reflect a desire to carry on as we have been and work with all those who participate and lead to press on in honing the crafts and gifts that we bring to worship. One of the very exciting things that has happened last year and that we hope will continue in the year to come has been finding new ways to take, in particular, our music ministries sort of out into the wider community, like through the St. Margaret's Youth Choir led by Laurel Chaplinsky and the Advent Musicians Vigil, which saw many, many people from the neighborhood wander in here just uh, on the brink of Christmas. We're looking forward to seeing what else the musicians of the parish under Lowell's leadership and guidance come up with. And as ever, we're also looking forward to continue to mark and celebrate the high holy days, and especially our Holy Week services, by turning all of our creative energies to focus on the richness of our liturgical tradition, making these services a key way in which we engage the mysteries of the faith. And one of the essential instruments of our worship, actually, is our building, and I don't just mean the noises that the radiator keeps making. Our building and our grounds. The budget for buildings and grounds really is truly, actually, literally, how we keep the lights on and care for the fabric of this place, this room of requirement that so many of us fall in love with. The budget for buildings and grounds uh, this year really is one for just keeping the lights on. We haven't included any new buildings and grounds projects, but we're also extremely grateful that we have just made so many incredible changes to the church in the last year, especially this gorgeous sanctuary floor that we're all standing on, uh, installed a year ago, and the Reredos at the beginning of 2021. Having completed, and beautifully, these major projects, one of the tasks before the Buildings and Grounds Committee for the coming year will be planning uh, and uh, looking for new projects. Um, the decrease in the budget here actually is largely re to, uh, related to just changes in staffing hours rather than actually planning to have the lights off more often than not. So there you have it. A tight budget, but one absolutely full of potential, full of creativity and commitment to the mission of this parish. It will not let us do everything that we could imagine doing. It will not come without its challenges. It will not be realized without passion, imagination, and courage. But it will not let us stop growing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bonnie and a Budget Committee. We will receive this presentation for information uh, I'm sure many of you have questions or comments. Hang on to them. We will have uh, opportunity for discussion when the budget comes to vote after our recess. Good. I would like now to declare five-minute recess. It is now 1.11 p.m. That means that I will call the meeting to order again at 1.16 p.m. So you all have five minutes. If anyone has any new business, please bring it in writing forward to me now during the recess. Uh, and scrutineers, please bring me the results of the ballot. You are dismissed for five minutes. Thank you. Say the delegates? Yeah. And I'll put them in alphabetical order, I guess? Or does it matter? We're just doing this order. Somebody might be like, we need to know the order, but I think alphabetical is fine. Like, okay. we need to know the order in the, in the minutes. Yeah, I need but their last. Need right, okay, but we don't so. Need to.
I'm going to just obliquely <laughs> say, I'm going to speak oh, in favor of the oh, budget, oh, great. just Thank in you. case there's any kind yeah, of I'm just going to give you a warning now. I'm going to be. Oh, just so I need the split of the congregation. <laughs> From the guy that prayed. Yeah. <laughs> prayed for <laughs> No, I'm fine, thank you. Just gotta mind the time. They were distributed last week, right? Like, you mean these ones?
afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order once again. The recess is now concluded. We will recommence our meeting. The time is 1.18 p.m. Uh, the first order of business we have returning to our meeting is a motion to set the time of adjournment. So what this is, is we is an anticipation of when we think the meeting is going to end. It's intended uh, just to make sure things move along smartly and we're not here all afternoon. So I would welcome a motion from the floor to set the time of adjournment for 2 p.m. as a target. Uh, Ryan mo makes that motion, second. Heather Dixon, second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Passed. We now have the presentation of the 2022 financial statements, and for this, we turn to Stu Taylor. Thanks, Clint. I'm not sure how we get out of here by two o'clock after my 90-minute finance presentation. <laughs> um, in, your, in your package, we really have kind of two key documents uh, reporting on the year gone by. One that looks like this, uh, your you know, narrative reports, the annual general meeting, and then hopefully you've all had a chance to take a look at the uh, financial statements. Both of these are stories of what has happened the past year. Um, one of them is an incredibly engaging, rich description of the activities and the ministry of this parish. Um, one of them might be a slightly mystifying, a little bit dry, not quite sure what to do with this report. I'm not going to comment on which is which. <laughs> But I do want to encourage you to see this as not just a set of numbers, but as a story. And I'll take a couple of minutes just to try and point out a few of the key numbers and what story are they telling us about the ministry of this parish, where we are today, where we're going. Um, but I also want to start just echoing the thanks given earlier for uh, the work of Stan Duick over the last 12 months uh, as treasurer. Uh, as was already remarked, um, Stan took on a whole bunch of projects that I think went above and beyond um, the basic requirements of Treasurer um, and kind of looked into a few closets and under a few cushions and, and cleaned up a few things. Um, and so thank you, Stan. I'm sure you're watching from Mexico. <laughs> Maybe he is. Um, so where do we start? Well. One of the things that I've learned um, working with the team over the last few years uh, and really hearing uh, Bonnie's strong teaching on stewardship uh, and the work of the stewardship committee is that where we start is with our offering and our faithfulness in giving uh, and our trust in God's faithfulness and our response to that. So we don't start with here's all the expenses and now we need to figure out how we're going to meet that budget. But we start with our consecration Sunday and the process that we go through of understanding um, the generosity and the gifting in this parish. So that's where we, we start this report as well, is looking at our offerings. Now these are our general offerings, so these are the offerings going into that budget that Bonnie was just talking about. Uh, it, this picture here does not include all of the designated offerings that are coming in for specific projects that we're taking on. So we can see the trend over the last 10 years here. And one of the messages I take from this is a message of encouragement. We've just come through a very uncertain period, a very difficult period for a lot of churches, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of businesses, for everybody. Um, and we really had no idea how was this going to go. And I think in the last, certainly in the last six months, we've been very encouraged to see our pews filling up again, to see the, the vibrancy in our worship. But this also tells us a story of faithfulness God's faithfulness and the faithful generosity of this parish through this period of uncertainty. And the fact that, yeah, we had this kind of actually strangely peak up in 2020, uh, but even the last two years of actual giving uh, have been above where the pre-pandemic levels were in terms of our general offering. So I think that is something for us to be thankful for right there. Um, so as you can see, uh, in the last two years we were Right around 529,000 in 2021, and then our general offerings came in around 525 
uh, in 2022, the year just finished. Um, let's see if that works. If we do add on those designated offerings that I was talking about, so that's the gray on top here. This is where we're giving to specific uh, specific projects like the refugee ministry, for example, has been designated gifts above and beyond our general giving. Uh, you can actually see this past year, um, you're above $644,000 in terms of total giving. Um, so if we look at that compared even to the year before, uh, which was around 629, um, that's a significant step up if you look at the overall generosity uh, of, this, of this parish. Um, it can be a little hard to judge year to year because there are, you know, very specific things that come up and people give to that. Um, but I also take encouragement from that picture. Um, there was also, just in the budget presentation, mention of the whole process of getting to how do we get that number. And um, that, again, starts with Consecration Sunday, the pledges that people are making, and then the work of uh, Ali and Heather and the budget committee and sort of looking at um, how do we understand what our giving is going to be. I find this also an encouraging picture because you can see here the gray bars are the bars where we said we think it's going to be right around here, and the blue bars are where we actually came in. Uh, and so you can see that um, over the last few years, we've either met when we were at this kind of high point in 2020 or actually exceeded that estimate of giving over the last couple of years. Um, that's very encouraging. And this year, the budget is also being set, uh, as Bonnie said, uh, $7,000 above where that estimate of giving sits. But I think we can move forward um, with confidence seeing that, that picture. Um, and I think it's also... Um, yeah, just a testament to mad skills of being able to forecast where that giving is going to come in. So, Ali, particularly to you, uh, kudos. Um, so now let's move over and look at our income statement. So this is where we look at what, was, what were the revenues coming in and then what were the expenditures, the things that we uh, spent money on, and where does that leave us? Um, so this is kind of what it, what it looks like. This is just to show you what it looks like on the page, what we're looking at. Um, but if we zoom in at our revenue, uh, this is what we were just speaking to. So we had set the budget at $523,000 for that offering portion. You can see there's other types of income. But for that general offering portion, we were expecting around $523,000 in order to meet our budget. In the end, our offering came in around $525,000. Um, and if you think... The original estimate for that general offering was around 513. So we had set the budget $10,000 above and then ended up coming in $2,000 yet above that budgeted figure. So that's a very encouraging uh, report. Um, if we move down to uh, the next part of income, um, this was the government grants that was talked about. We had budgeted 15,000. It came in just below 10. So we were a little bit more than $5,000 below um, what we had expected there. And that's why then for our total revenues, um, if you sort of net off being $2,000 above in our general giving and a little bit over $5,000 below, we came in just a little bit over $3,000 below that total expected revenue. Then if we look at the, uh, our operating expenses, um, we had budgeted uh, for $517,900 um, in operating expenses, and that's the kind of budget that we were just, uh, just looking at, what we did last year, uh, the portions of that that are not the mortgage. Um, we came in at $517,975. <laughs> I don't know how many of you work with budgets and financial management, <laughs> But if you have a budget that's over a half million dollars and you come in $75 off, it's a hole in one. you start firing people because like, that's really incompetent. How do you miss by $75? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> if I could meet my budgets within $75, that would be uh, pretty incredible. So um, now what, what does that, that's a big number. So what does that entail? Well, if we flip over the page, and we go to the operating expense details. This may look familiar to you because this is kind of the format in which we do our budgeting, uh, which includes all of the expenses that it takes in terms of operations and ministry. Um, and then we also budget in 
that those mortgage interest payments and the payments on the principal of the mortgage, um, because even those in accounting terms, the principal payments on the mortgage are not expenses per se, it's cash that we need to have in order to make those payments. So that is kind of where we uh, set the overall budget. So you can see here in terms of the details, um, there was some, uh, we went over a bit on governance and infrastructure, and part of the story there is that um, the diocese in this past year actually changed the way in which they were handling payroll, um, which involved increase in expenses. They were bringing in a person to basically do payroll at the diocesan level, and that was going to cost us, because they were then charging on the basis of per employee, and we have a large number of employees, many of them on very, um, you know, very part-time basis, but they were charging just on a per-employee basis, um, was going to be costing us, uh, I think, just over $5,000 a year in additional uh, payroll expenses. So uh, we've made the decision to move payroll in-house to basically save that $5,000 going forward, um, but we weren't able to just kind of turn that on a dime. So that's where you see some additional spending that happened this past year um, was on those, those payroll costs. Um, and on the buildings and ground side, uh, we had some unexpected uh, repairs. Uh, there were some windows that were broken um, and so had to deal with that as well as some increases in our uh, insurance costs. Um, so we came in a little bit over on the, the building and ground side. Um, depreciation, uh, I'm going to propose a Lenten group uh, the next five <laughs> weeks talking about depreciation, what it means, why we recorded on our statement. Um, all to say, I, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but this was one of the pieces that Stan was paying attention to and helping the vestry to pay attention to. You can essentially think of it as drawing down past unfunded capital expenses. So where we had done past projects, this could be going way back, um, where we didn't necessarily have all of the funds, um, this depreciation shows up on the, uh, on the income statement and year to year we will be kind of drawing that down so that we don't have sort of this large amount of past projects just kind of sitting on our, sitting on our books. Um, those of you who are interested are happy to meet with you afterwards to talk a little bit more about that. But essentially what it means is it shows up as an expense, but it doesn't affect our cash, right? Like this isn't cash coming out of the bank, um, but it is something where we're basically recognizing expenses we incurred in the past. We didn't recognize them as expenses at the time. That's just the way that you handle some of these large capital projects like a new floor. You depreciate it over time. So you take that expense and you just say over the next 10 years, we're going to expense that out uh, year by year. This is a, a smaller number here, and just so you know, kind of in accounting terms, when it's in parentheses, it's a negative number. Um, so this is a negative uh, expense, so it's a positive. Um, about $3,500, and when I talked about Stan sort of going under the cushions and whatnot, um, there was a number of payments that had been made in past years, so they were expensed, they were treated as if they'd gone out of the bank, but maybe checks were never cashed or, you know, we're not sure the story on all of them, uh, but Stan did quite a lot of legwork to kind of reconnect with people who might have received that check, and maybe it was like somewhere in the bottom of their purse somewhere. Um, but we were able to then sort of write off $35,000, or $35,000, $3,500 in, in past expenses um, that we will no longer be expecting to, uh, to, to pay. So that was kind of a, a positive uh, or a decrease in our uh, in our expenses. It's kind of decreasing expenses we incurred in the past and we don't expect mm -hmm. to actually incur. Um, so this gives us a net income which is affected by that depreciation number. Um, now it's quite a bit lower than that net income number, um, but like I say, that's uh, what we're actually budgeting to is kind of our cash position. Um, and so uh, mortgage doesn't show up as an expense because it's basically, the, the mortgage principal was basically taking cash and turning it into uh, our property here. Um, and so it's not considered an expense, it's just a change uh, in, the, in the type of asset that you have. Um, so when we're paying our mortgage principal though, we do need to have that money, so we put that into our cash flow here. Um, like I said, uh, from our, our net income, our, our depreciation, that's not cash coming out of the bank, so we kind of add that back in, say that's not actually cash flow. Um, 
We did have some uh, expenses that have been booked in the previous year that then we actually paid uh, in this past year. So that's the 4,000, which is, that is cash going out of the bank. Uh, and then the mortgage uh, obviously is cash coming out of the bank. So we put all, that all together. Um, we had about, we ended with about $3,000 uh, of negative cash flow in our, in our general, uh, general accounts. Um, but like I say, on a, on a budget of over a half million dollars, that's not at all a cause for concern. Um, now, we, we've been talking about the, the general income statement. Um, the designated fund activity tells a story of all of those other areas of ministry that are not covered in the budget that was just presented, uh, or the budget that we passed last year, um, but are very important areas of this parish's ministry. Um, as you can see, you know, one of the stories is just, there's a lot going on. Um, an, another key piece is uh, the refugee ministry. You can see there's a lot of activity there, and that just kind of matches up with what we know of families that we've been able to welcome in this past year. Uh, and so you can see there's activity, both more funds coming in in terms of fundraising for refugee ministry, but also a good number of funds going out. And that is cash being transformed into real, tangible support for new families coming in that this parish is um, taking in and supporting. Um, so happy to take any, any questions on the, the details of that in a moment, but I won't, I won't walk through all of these. Um, but I think also uh, part of the story is um, you know, the, the passing of some beloved members of this, this congregation um, and faithful members of this congregation where then there have been um, offerings that have come in um, where there have been estate funds that have come in in this past year uh, and offerings in honor and in memory of people, um, which don't just go into our general offering but are set aside here and then the vestry and the executive have worked together to allocate those into more specific areas of ministry and growth. Um, so those are some areas within our, within our designated fund activity. We're almost there. Uh, and now the balance sheet. So the income statement kind of talks about the activity during the year, and the balance sheet is sort of like, what's the level of the water right now? So where, where are we today? Um, as you can see, our total cash has actually gone up, um, but that includes um, an amount of $35,000 uh, that we're kind of holding as a deposit against um, a, a refugee sponsorship. Um, so not all of that is just kind of general cash sitting in the, in the account. Uh, you can see here, property, plant, and equipment is a very strange term. To, it's kind of like a standard accounting term. It's kind of a weird way of thinking about the church building and grounds. Uh, but that's what it is here. Uh, and you can see that's gone up. And what is the story there? Well, it's what, well, I'm not quite standing on it, but you have your feet on it, our new floor. Um, and... Also, we have the Reredos here. That has gone up over the last couple of years as we have made some investments uh, in our building and grounds. And so that's just how that's reflected on our balance sheet uh, in, in, in those numbers. Okay, so finally, um, put all that together. There's, there's cash in the bank, but as we've seen, uh, there's a good amount of that cash that's already kind of designated towards specific things. So then we ask the question, how much cash do we have actually available for general activities? So if we take our total current assets, which is basically the cash in the bank, plus we have some funds, uh, we're able to claim a, a GST rebate from the government. Um, so we, we lump that in there too, because if there's $7,000 uh, receivable from the government for GST, it's not difficult for us to turn that into cash relatively quickly. Um, and then our liabilities. This could be amounts that we're currently owing to people, um, but also those designated funds, um, we count against that because we don't want to go spending all of our designated cash and then not have the funds available when we need to use it to support uh, a new refugee family, for example. If we tell the refugee committee this is the amount in the designated fund, we want to make sure we actually have that money available for use when it's needed. Um, and so we, we take that out and say, how much is then left over, which is kind of 
available for our general activities. And that's going into that, into that general budget. So you can see this year, that number comes in around $15,000. Last year, it was a very similar picture, uh, just shy of $14,000. Um, this is kind of like what I would call, like there, there's sort of a Goldilocks number here. Like you don't want that number to be really big because uh, it means you're sitting on cash and you're not turning it into ministry, which is what we're about. We're not a bank. We're not into just holding large amounts of money. But you also don't want that number to be too small or to be negative. It means that then if this number is negative, we're kind of using that cash. We're sort of borrowing against ourselves, um, which is okay over a short term, but you don't want to get into a place where you then actually don't have the cash available to follow through on, on your obligations. Um, and this number goes up and down through the year. You know, we have quite a bit of giving at the end of the year. So through the year, you'll see this number will go negative, but we don't get too worried about that. And it kind of comes up and down a little bit. Um, but this is, I think, a really good place to be if you just think we've got money available for cash flow, but we're not sitting on large amounts of cash that are not being turned into, into ministry. Um, so that's, that's the tour. Um, and you know what, this story uh, told in finances, if you sit on the vestry, you get to hear this every month. <laughs> so, and follow that story through. Yes, Heather. One question, uh, one slide back, maybe we could go back. So the question was, what's the difference between the Catholic and the Catholic? Can I go back? I just have a question. Uh, pardon me, maybe it might be another one. The affordable okay. housing portion. What is that? Did you want to speak to that one? So we, we, we have a share at the Old Grace Affordable Housing, uh, which is just a couple of blocks from here. Did you have anything you want to say? I don't know if I can explain adequately exactly how that works, but the church is holding basically a unit yeah, that then is able to be available. Yeah, who... our, share enables, um, our share enables an, a low-income family or um, individual to be able to live in that suite. Um, that otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, pay the down payment or, or buy into the co-op in order to live there. Um, this actually, I think, represents both St. Margaret's own share as well as um, a sort of second share from a group of parishioners, but it's not sort of technically or formally St. Margaret's share, just, just to be extra confusing about that. <laughs> Eric. Eric, just uh, the, the mic is here. No, come. Yep. Oh, you okay? Eric. Here we go. Thank you, Bonnie. This is uh, just trying to get a little bit of understanding here. This is sort of a question. In designated giving, there's a worship one for eighteen, sixteen thousand dollars. Now, I was under the impression that designated giving was sort of like refugee funds, university. Pastor University and that sort of thing. So how do I want to understand the worship designated funds? So that, that one, I believe, basically is donations toward an organ. All right. Um, so it's kind of, it shows up in the designated funds as a more kind of generic term of worship. But there's actually, those funds that have come in have been very specifically designated um, toward a new organ. Thanks again. Just to follow up, why isn't the floor, for example, in the same category? Good question. So um, we do actually have a separate place which is designated for future capital projects. Um, but the floor uh, at this point is zero because we had the funds uh, donated and those were used and the, the balance now is, is zero. Uh, and that m then moves into, uh, there's another area on the balance sheet um, which is uh, deferred capital, past capital projects or capital projects deferred. Um, oops. So we, we, it's, it's just because accounting-wise, we've had a separate line that we've used, particularly for most of our larger capital projects, uh, and that shows up on the, on the balance sheet. So it hasn't been treated as a designated fund in the same way. 
This is, this is according to Robert's, rule, Robert's Rules of Order. This is the last one I can ask, so be happy. It, there's, transparency is what I'm looking for, right? It, it doesn't appear very transparent when you start going through this kind of stuff, because I know people gave to the floor quite generously over the years, right? And, and big quests came and were used for the floor. So. Yeah, I think that's something that we can, we can note and say um, for the capital projects, we can do a presentation that shows those, those amounts. Um, it's, like I say, it's just been a factor of kind of where that sits in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the balance sheet. So we have, like, if you can think of like designated funds are typically expensed right when they're spent. Um, and then the capital projects, because of the way that they're handled accounting wise, they're not expensed right away. Um, and so it gets kind of moved into a different line, which then is drawn down over time with, with de as it gets depreciated. Um, now that said, uh, it's not totally consistent because you can see like the Raridos is in there. Um, in part that's because it was originally expensed and then it's kind of been capitalized. Um, so the bottom line is I, I hear you on that and I think there's a way in which we can use that designated fund schedule to also show all of our capital projects uh, and then just be clear sort of what number lines up with what on the balance sheet. So there, there's an area on the balance sheet where you'll see um, I'm not doing a very good job of navigating here. Um, uh, I think we need to go forward. Oh, there we are. Um, designated funds and bequests here. So the idea is like that number balances to what's on the designated fund schedule. And then down here we have designated for future capital projects. Uh, so you can see last year we had 44,564 sitting in that. That was the remaining amount on the floor because we had already done a down payment on the floor. Um, and so that was the amount remaining on the floor project that had been raised but not yet spent. Uh, and you can see now as of December 31st that's sitting at zero. Um, but there is a way in which we could bring this into the designated fund schedule and then just show there's two balances. One of the general ministry's designated funds here and then one that aligns with the designated for future capital projects. Here. Uh, so for the floor, it would have an opening balance of 44, like what, what it would look like, opening balance of 44,564 on January 1st, and then 44,564 went out. Uh, I don't think anything more came in, um, and then the balance would be zero. Does that make sense? All right, Th thank you so much, Stu. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to bring this part of our meeting to a close. Let's give Stu a round of applause. Thank you. And the presentation of the 2022 financial statements will be received for information. We turn now to the next item on our agenda, which is Ministry Report St. Margaret's Youth Group by the Youth ministry team. Tracy, please take the floor with your team. Sorry, before we get started, I'd just like to put forward a point of order to propose a new motion to extend the adjournment time. We previously said 2 p.m. and it doesn't look like we're going to hit that. Uh, I was, I I was going to say, should I? Yeah, mine's seven minutes, so. So I'll welcome a motion to extend to. <laughs> yeah, I have a motion to extend to 2.30. To 2.30? Ugh. Sorry, Clint. <laughs> I'm just doing this to save everybody the hassle of. Yeah. I, okay, to there's a motion to 2:30 uh, or sooner. Is there or a sooner. is there a or second sooner. to this motion? I see a second in the back. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand. Looking for a majority. That's barely a majority, but I think we got it. All right. Thank you very much. We're gonna stand in front of you guys. Our apologies, but. Um, as the Children uh, and Youth Ministry Coordinator here at St. Margaret's, I have the joy of working with these people. Nathan, you're going to give a nod or a saw, Sarah, and Colton. Um, and the vision of the St. Oh, am I kind of, I'm okay? The vision of the St. Margaret's Youth Group is to create environments in which the youth of our parish and wider community discover the grace of God made known in Jesus Christ. Towards that end, we have three weekly gatherings. Friday night at 6 p.m., there's a Bible study led by Sarah, and the average attendance is about six. 
Uh, Friday evening events, all three of our leaders are there, and the average attendance to that is about 15. And Sunday mornings, Nathan and Sarah um, tag team for Sunday school. And the attendance in the fall, I just did this, uh, Lowell saw me doing stats on Friday night, um, is about 10. But in January, there's been like 15 to 20 kids in the basement every week. So God's doing something in that crowded room. Um, But to get a better picture of the ministry, I thought we could hear from each of the leaders. And so I'm going to start with you, Nathan. Talk to us about what are you doing down there on those Sunday mornings? What is Sunday school all about? I'm going to make you move. Okay. Um, Yeah, so Sunday mornings, well, I'll speak more to my part than Sarah does some spiritual practice of Sunday mornings. I'm not involved with that, so I won't speak to what she does with that. Um, But what I like doing on Sunday mornings is we do the lectionary reading. Usually it's the gospel. And it's kind of just a time where the kids or the youth get to ask the questions that they want to ask and I help guide the conversation and hopefully we can land on some answers. But it's, I try and make it a time where they get to yeah, explore the questions um, that the text is presenting to them and yeah, kind of try and help them out where I can as well in, in all the wisdom I have, I guess. <laughs> um, this year you changed your role with... Uh... Uh, youth ministry and that he came on to more hours a week, 10 hours a week, including coordinating Friday nights. What difference has that made for you and why did you do it, Nathan? <laughs> um, I don't know what difference it's made, but I'll say why, why I did is I've always enjoyed... Well, me, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've always enjoyed kind of being involved in youth. I guess like growing up, uh, I didn't go to this church, but youth is always a big part of my life and then stuff like uh, being involved in Manitoba Pioneer Camp for numerous years. And so, yeah, being involved in youth ministry has just always kind of been a thing for me. It's something I've enjoyed, and it's something that I do see as important. And so that's why I've kind of, yeah, I've been willing and enjoyed uh, taking on an added responsibility this past year. Thank you. We're going to move on to Sarah here. Sarah, what, how do you think a church youth group meets the needs of youth? Okay. Um... I asked some of the youth why they go to youth group, and the answer that I got generally was that they come for the community, they come to have a place to hang out after a stressful week, Um, and I think that a lot of that is true. I think that what youth group provides is a place for youth to belong, and I think that while they can belong to their friends at school or their clubs, I think that what the church does um, with youth group is it it brings I guess us in and other kids who affirm who they are and point them towards the gospel of Jesus Christ so yeah thanks Sarah so um, there's Friday Night Bible Studies new how did that come about Um, so as many of you know there was a Camino trip in June July (laughs) They both start with J, it's the same. Um, And I was on that, and there were were three other leaders, and there were four youth. Um, And as we were walking the trail, I kept asking them over and over again, what should we do in youth group next year? Give me your input. And the answer that I received from them was, we want to read more of the Bible. So that was the idea behind the Bible study. And because they want to read more of the Bible, we've decided to tackle a book at a time, larger chunks per week, four chapters a week is our average of what we do. Um, and then, yeah, we come together and discuss what we've noticed. I'm going to switch with you again. Hi, hey, Colton. Colton's a Friday night guy. What brings you back week after week? Um, I just want to start by saying I feel like a pro athlete at a press conference. <laughs> um, I'm that good. I'm an well, and, and to keep with the, with the theme, I'm going to say... My highlight is being on such an amazing team, you know. We have, we have our Michael Jordan over here, Nathan Lechman. He, you know, is a stoic leader among men. And uh, he recently joined our team, so it's like when Michael Jordan went to go play baseball and then he came back. That's Nathan Lechman. And then we have Sarah. She's like Scotty Pippen, you know, a tough two-way player. She, like, really cares about getting to know the youth, but also about their spiritual formation. And I, obviously, am Dennis Rodman. <laughs> But you, you can't have it, you can't, you know, you need, for Dennis Rodman, you need a great coach. You need a Phil Jackson. And that's our, our great Tracy, Tracy Curl. 
I feel like every week I'm like so taken aback by Tracy. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's just so amazing at her job. <laughs> she really knows how to keep me in check, so I'm really appreciative for her and for you know my co-stars over here. And obviously, uh, we have a great group of kids that it's been my great pleasure to be uh, their youth leader and get to know them a little better. <laughs> now I want to hear the answer to this next question. Uh, what was the highlight of 2022 youth? Yeah, I went off script there, so Tracy's got to ask the question again. <laughs> My highlight was the canoe trip. We went on a canoe trip to Mento Pioneer Camp for our retreat. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I spent a lot of time there in the summer, so being able to bring the youth out there to a place that's very special to me was obviously a lot of fun. Well, I want to say thank you. Thank you to these leaders. They are caring, thoughtful, interesting, keep me on my toes, um, and they are very motivated. I'll tell you this, like, they do this because they want to. Like, this, they're very motivated to do this work, and so I'm so grateful for these three. And I also want to say thank you to you, the congregation. Thank you to you parents who bring your kids to church. Thank you to this congregation for supporting the Camino by your finances and your prayers. And to all of you for your continued support of this ministry of caring about, being interested in, and praying for our youth and our youth leaders. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tracy and the team. Uh, we will now uh, entertain a motion to receive this report and indeed all the reports as printed in the circular which was previously shared. I don't believe there's any amendments to any of those reports, so I'm looking for a motion to receive these reports. Okay, got one, a motion. Is there a second? Uh, Amy Knight is a second. Uh, any discussion on this, comments? Not seeing any, we'll put it to a vote. All those in favor, uh, please raise your hands. We have a majority. Good. We now turn back to our 2023 budget. I'll be looking for a member of the budget committee to make a motion to approve the budget. Thank you, Heather. Is there a second? Uh, from, I look from the budget committee be best. Is there anyone from? No. Uh, did you ask a question? No, what, um, it, usually we go, if the motion isn't seconded, it's not a live motion yet. So we can't really have discussion or questions on it, right? So unless you want to make an alternate motion about the budget, let's wait for the second then, and then we'll get to the questions. Is there a second? Okay, thank you. We've got, got a second there. That's good. Okay, now we open for discussion. Nathan, what's your question? Um, I'm just wondering about the where the reduction in partnerships uh, is uh, coming from. Not Manitoba Pioneer Camp. Oh, ah. okay. Um, <laughs> but other, um, essentially, it came from um, money for new partnerships, establishing new partnerships. So we basically we took out something that we hadn't. Um, allocated. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Is there any, uh, like there was mention of an Arasha conference, is that, like where is that coming into this budget? That will largely be funded from designated gifts okay. and from other fundraising. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I have two questions. Uh, first is just wanted to uh, ask about the cost overrun of $8,500 about in the worship line of last year. The spending? The spending. The actual, yep. That, ha that actually has largely to do with um, a misallocation of a, of a staff stipend. Oh. So a stipend that ought to have been included in the staff missioner line was included in the worship. That's ah, most of that. And I, the children in worship increase, which I think is completely justified, but I'm, I'm just wanted to get some clarity on that. That's, I'm assuming that's due to the growing number of children Actually, it's, it's more closely related to increasing, I ensuring that all of our staff are brought up to the new provincial minimum wage. Uh, so it actually is mostly reflects staffing hours and okay. pay. So those, 
the staffing hours are the, the, the program staff yeah are in the children worship line and not the missioner line. yeah so the staff missioner line just includes the staff that are on for 15 hours a week or more the other um, staff are included in we think of them as program staff and their stipends are included in the ministry area okay great thank question you. In the proposed budget for adult Christian formation, there's an asterisk. What does it mean? Excellent question. Um, the asterisk is a little bit of a typo, but it really is worth asking about. Um, the, that asterisk was there to remind, um, as a footnote for the vestry, for them to take into account that this adult Christian formation budget does not include money for the Slater McGuire lecture. It um, will have to fundraise for the Slater McGuire lecture separately. However, the vestry in approving this budget also approved the use of, of um, enough, um, I think it's $7,000 from the estate gifts in order to fund the Slater McGuire lecture for this year. So the Slater McGuire lecture is still funded. It isn't actually reflected in the budget, but great mm. question. Thank you, Kristen. Are there any other questions or comments about the 2023 proposed budget? Not seeing any, uh, I would like to uh, uh, put this to vote. All those in favor of approving the proposed budget as presented, please raise your hands. All those opposed, please raise your hands. The ayes have it. The budget is declared approved. I'd now like to share a uh, notice of election results. So we only had one balloted election for uh, uh, synod delegates. I declare the following people elected as synod delegates for St. Margaret's for 2023. I will list them in alphabetical order. Tracy Curl, Paul Dick, Caleb Olfert, Nathan Rempel. The other four previously named nominees will serve as alternates. Thank you. We come now to new business. I did not receive any written notification of new business. So we then now move to our closing. Um, I'd like to make uh, room for announcements in this final section. Uh, but perhaps before the announcements, we'll go to uh, Bonnie's closing remarks. Uh, my closing remarks are very, very brief. I really just would like to thank again Clint Curl for uh, chairing this meeting and for Jana uh, for serving as our secretary. Would you join with me in thanking them? I also just can't resist making one more shout out to Ali Vidal and Kristen McLean for their incredible work in helping us to find such accurate and compelling estimates of giving. Thank you so much for the work that you put into that. And thank you to all of you. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you for staying. Thank you for taking on this business, for making this parish your home, and for really carrying forward the mission and vision of this parish with so much uh, beauty and integrity and faith. Amy. Hello. Uh, many of you will have seen in the bulletin announcement this week. Uh, our long-awaited retirement celebration for David and Ruth Whittacombe will be happening the weekend of April 29th and 30th, so put it on your calendars. Uh, it will be kicked off on the Friday night by a dinner that the Southeast Asian com um, community will be hosting for David and Ruth, which I'm told is how it all got started some 30 so years ago, so it's a fitting way to start our celebration. On the Saturday evening, there'll be a... Uh, it's a ball, but also a reception with speeches and um, replies from David and Ruth. So if you don't like dancing, still come to hear the speeches and eat the delicious food that will be catered by Pioneer Camp. They have a Red Seal chef who does all the food at Pioneer, so it's delicious. And then on Sunday, David will be preaching at the morning service, and we will have another reception afterwards with like a 
fruit and desserts and a light, some light fare. <laughs> Uh, so yes, oh, the uh, ball will be at the Ukrainian Labor Temple at 591 Pritchard. And you can all expect some sort of invitation getting emailed to you in the next little while. We will need RSVPs for the ball. And I'm sure there'll be some at the back as well for people who aren't on the email list. So keep your eyes open for that. All right. Thank you very much, Amy. Are there any further announcements? Going once, going twice. In that case, I would welcome a motion to adjourn at 2.03 p.m. Would anyone like to make that? Okay, we have a motion at the back. And I believe motions to adjourn don't need a second, do they? Right? No. So I can declare as chair this parish meeting adjourned. Thank you so much. We'll now uh, invite Lowell to come forward to lead us in a closing song. I'd like to invite Eric forward to lead us in a closing prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for this meeting today. We thank you for the fact that it was laughter and enjoyment and people were able to ask questions. And we give you thanks for this church and its leadership that has created such an environment. And now as we look forward to the coming year, we say the following prayer. O oh God, Holy Spirit, sanctifier of the faithful, sanctify this parish by thine abiding presence. Bless those who minister in holy things. Enlighten the minds of thy people more and more with the light of the everlasting gospel. Bring erring souls to the knowledge of God our Savior and those who are walking in the way of life Keep steadfast unto the end. Give patience to the sick and afflicted, and renew them in body and soul. Guard from forgetfulness of you those who are strong and prosperous. Increase in us thy manifold gifts of grace, and make us all to be faithful in good works. O blessed Spirit, and with the Father and the Son, together we worship and glorify one God, world without end. Amen. Amen.